Good evening, Winchester. Welcome to Visual Radio Live. It's December 5th, 2013. And we've lost Nelson Mandela, a great, great humanitarian. A man who fought for civil rights, free speech, and more. The views and opinions on Visual Radio are those of the host, Joe Villone, and his guests, Jonathan Paley and Frank Delastrito, and not necessarily those of Winchester Community Access and Media. It's board of directors, it's staff, members, and uh, look at that. Good evening. Hey, Joe. Is this Jonathan Paley? He's speaking. I just finished my disclaimer. Man, you were right on cue. Are you psychic? I guess, I guess I'm psychic. Psychic. Jonathan Paley of the Paley Brothers has a brand new record out. Uh, I call them records. Is that okay, Jonathan? Hey, yeah. Well, I'm hoping that it will come out on vinyl at some point. You know, we were talking about that yesterday. Um, do, are you familiar with Eagle Vision? Uh, no, I'm not. What is that? Eagle Vision is this great company. They've had Alice Cooper out. They've had, uh, oh, I, I just reviewed the Dream Theater, the guys from Berkeley. They got Roxy Music, Brian Ferry solo out. But the Rolling Stones, even though they have their deal with what, UMG currently, they, um, the Rolling Stones have a deal for vinyl on Eagle Vision. So I got these beautiful double record sets, the Rolling Stones live in Texas, the Rolling Stones with uh, Muddy Waters. Double discs, impeccably packaged, Jonathan. Oh, look at this. Uh, Eagle Vision, I'll, have to, I'll check them out. See if you can arrange something. Now, you know Carol Kay, the great bass player from The Wrecking Crew, right? Yes. yes. There's, there's a second Carol Kay who worked for Bill Coin. She's a publicist in New York. She's married to Ricky Bird, remember? The band Susan? Yeah. Yeah. And then Ricky Bird joined uh, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. So Carol handles Eagle Vision. She's the publicist for them. Well, I will, uh, I will look them up, see if I can get in touch with them. Yeah, and then, you know, in England, England uh, vinyl's the rage. Cherry Red Records, that might be a perfect label for you. Well, we're going to have to make some kind of arrangement with uh, Real Gone Music, the, the guys that, you know, that put out our CD, and see if we can, uh, see if we can do something. Yeah, because the Paley's are like vinyl. I have the 12-inch you did with the new Rendezvous. Right, right. That's the EP you're talking about? Yeah, it's a great EP with you and your brother on the cover. Yeah, produced by Jimmy Iovine. Jimmy worked with Grand Funk, didn't he? No, I don't think so. He worked with you know, John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen, I mean, you know, uh, Patti Smith. Uh, and now he, and now he, 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 he runs Interscope. He owns Interscope Records. Oh, he does? Yeah, okay. he's, he's, he's huge. He's still going. I was thinking of Jimmy Iano, the guy with the smile. No, no. It's yeah. Bluesheimers at my age, you know. I, I should know these things off the top of my head, but... Um, hey, now is this, are we on the air now? Oh, we are, absolutely. I, I did my disclaimer, and you phoned right in. Okay, there's something i got to say, Joe. Uh, someone got married today in Boston, um, and I just want to send out my... my Congratulations and my best wishes to Judy Dombrowski, um, who I will always love. Uh, she got married today. Congratulations, Judy. Your husband, I, have, I don't even know your husband's name, but he, he's a very, very lucky man. And I wish you both just uh, you know, the most happiness in the world. And I'll always love you, Judy. And um, I, hope you, I hope you hear this. Well, we will be up on YouTube in about a week, maybe earlier than that. Okay. So she'll get to see it. Judy actually took uh, the cover of the CD is a mixture of two pictures. One of the pictures is of me at Madison Square Garden. It was taken by Roberta Bailey, but the picture of Andy is from the Paradise Show, and that was actually taken by Judy Zembrowski. Ah. Now, when you say the Paradise Show, which Paradise Show? Uh, when were we open for the Flaming Groovies? I was there. Yeah. That was a great night. I had, I had fun. Uh, it was, you know, it was, uh, real, it was great for me, and, and uh, you know, I love the Flaming Groovies. They're a great band. They're still going. They're still playing. Shake Some Action. Now, the vinyl of Shake Some Action on Sire, they were your label mates, right? That's right, yeah. So, I, I like 
shake some action on the vinyl, 12 inch. But if you got the seven inch 45, did you know they did a different version? A lot hotter edge, and I loved the 45 of Shake Some Action. Yeah, that's a good one. Actually, I think there's, I, I think there's another version, too. I, there, there, there seem to be a few of them out there floating around. Uh, but that is the best one, the, the, the 7-inch. Now, what was the band at the Paradise Theater backing you guys up? Well, it was uh, the Mirrors Eaters, uh, Steve Cataldo, um, Rod Skeen on bass, uh, Jeff Wilkinson on drums, Alan Habditch on guitar, along with Steve. We had a, a, just a fabulous pianist, um, Jeff Lass, who is all over the record, also co-wrote some of the songs. Just a great, great piano player. Uh, and is actually out here in Southern California. He does a lot of uh, television and movie work now. And then we had, um, let me see, uh, Chris Phillips on percussion. And my brother and I, and that was the uh, that was the band. See, that shows you the the years because you know the Nervous Eaters are my friends, of course. You guys are my friends, and I, I forgot that very important point. Jeff Wilkinson, what a drummer! Uh, one of the greatest. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, if if you listen to the uh, Ace of Hearts Nervous Eaters record, Hot Steel and Acid, it's uh, I mean Rick. It's got such a great drum sound on that record, and Jeff is just, is just so good on that record. I love that record. Um, it's really the quintessential, you know, Nervous Eaters record to me. And I'm very proud to, you know, be playing bass on that record. Our good friend Rick Hart will be on my show. We're in touch quite frequently, but we haven't made a date yet for him to be here. Yeah, and I actually, uh, you know, I, I did a... I did a uh, the show uh, about a week ago on uh, RPM on the uh, uh, Luxury Lounge, Luxuria, and uh, we played uh, we played a cut from the from the Hot Steel and Acid record. Uh, She's gonna be my baby, and I talked about Rick a little bit, and um, and I so I emailed Rick to let him know about that, and he says he'll be down at the. I guess they're playing with the real kids at the uh, Middle East on the 28th of December. Boy, I wish I could be there for that. <laughs> Uh, I only go out now if I'm videotaping because my ears, ha through the years and years of torture in the clubs, you know, I protect my ears. That does sound like an awesome show. Hey, man, put on some, put on some headphones, you know, put on some headphones and some earplugs and go down there with your video camera. I, I'd be there if I, if I could. Yeah, a post-Christmas party with the real kids and the Nervous Eaters. That's pure Boston rock and roll from our era. Right. So, the name of the CD is, um, come again, uh, you know, what's the title of the compilation? It's, it's called The Complete Recording. Now, which, yeah, which of course I've reviewed and I have it on three sites, but I can't remember anything these days. The Complete uh, Recordings. It's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a, you know, we went through a lot of tapes, a lot of mixes, a lot of, this, but there's actually a lot more. Um, you know, that's in the in vault, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we'll do a volume two at some point. But uh, yeah, right now that's, that's what it is. It's called the complete recordings. The Paley Brothers, the complete recordings, the real gone record, real gone music. Um, now there's like 24 tracks on it. I believe it's 26. 26, which is really pushing a, a CD. That's great. Yeah, that, that was a that was a thing. I mean, that was we had a, a limit. As much as you could fit on one CD, so we had to kind of, uh, you know, Andy and I had to kind of haggle about um, what was going to go on there besides the, the uh, stuff that was released, and um, so, you know, I think there's either 14 or 15 tracks on there that have never, you know, never been released before, plus there's um, uh, Jacques Cousteau by the Young Jacques, which was Andy and I and a bunch of other people, uh, it's a really uh, a great novelty record, and um, you know. But I really am hoping that we can, uh, you know, we'll be able to do a second, a volume two, and get some more, get some more of our stuff out there. So let's talk about a couple of the tracks. Two of them uh, were recorded with Sean Cass. Well, opening for Sean Cassie at Madison Square Garden. That's right. How were they recorded? 
You know, I, I, I they were recorded onto, um, I, I was, yeah, it was a two track, um, but it was, uh, there was um, a lot more stuff. I think that's another one where we had to, you know, decide which tracks we were going to use. There's a great, great version of um, um, Ring Ring, the ABBA song. Whoa. I, I really wanted to put on there, but, um, you know, it, 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 the thing was the vocals on, the vocals were not quite as tight on Ring Ring as they are on uh, Felicia and Sheila. Uh, so maybe that'll come out of the next one. But, there, you know, there, there's just, I, 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 love, I love the way we covered that song. It's got a very unique kind of uh, arrangement of it. And maybe that'll see the light of day. But, uh, well, you know, opening for Sean Cash was an incredible experience. We did about a half a dozen dates with him. All, you know, huge arenas, and, um, you know, we played at Toronto Blue Jay Stadium. I think there were like 60,000 people there. It was, it was just, it was crazy, but it was wonderful. Did you tape all of the gigs? Uh, you know, I'm sure that there are tapes. I don't know if they still exist or not, because there was, you know, that, that they traveled with all that stuff, and, you know, they're, they're probably, they probably had tapes running at most of those gigs, if not all of them, but the ones that we were able to... What we were able to find, which was in um, Seymour Stein's uh, storage area, uh, where he had an incredible amount of, of music uh, out in Long Island. Uh, that's what we found, and that's what we went through. That That is, like, fascinating. So did the Crystals show up for Sean Cassidy? The Crystals? Yeah, they appeared on one of his live albums uh, doing, what was his song, To Do Run Run? He had a, a, a remake of yeah. one of their hits. Yeah, that was a big hit for him. Now, they, 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 they didn't show up at any of the shows that we did, but it's funny that you mentioned them because Darlene Love, who, you know, is you know, the voice of the Crystals and you know, the lead singer, one of the greatest singers of all time, in my opinion, uh, when we were, when we were um, rehearsing for the Phil Spector um, recordings that uh, we did, uh, or recording that we did with Phil Spector, spent about almost you know, two or three weeks Rehearsing at Phil's house when he was still living in um, in uh, West Hollywood in the hills, and Darlene Love came over maybe four or five times, and she would come over and uh, she would you know they, she would you know stand at the piano and Phil would play and she would just belt out these songs and, and just one of the most incredible voices to ever exist. I mean just and she's and she's still going. She's still playing. Well, every Christmas she's on Dave Letterman. Yeah, yeah, I see her. Yeah, she does that every every Christmas. She's not doing the Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. Great, great record. Um, you know, if you listen to the stuff that she did uh, with the Crystals, they're under you know under the name Darling Love. I mean, it's, you know, like things like uh, Fine Fine Boy, uh, Say I Met the Boy I'm Gonna Marry. Uh, I mean, just uh, you listen to, you listen to her voice, and it's just I mean, nobody can touch touch what she does in those records. It's just incredible. She did a Home Alone 1 or 2, the soundtrack she did All Alone for Christmas. What a great song. I, you know, I, I haven't even heard that one. I'll have, to, I'll have to look that one up. Oh, look it up on YouTube or something, man. All Alone for Christmas, Darling Love. It'll, it'll knock you out. It's just like right back from the heyday. So she remained friends with Spectre. I didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, Phil... I mean, you know, God bless him, and it's, and it's sad what's happened, and, you know, I, 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 I really can't say who knows what happened, who knows what the hell happened, but, you know, my experience with him was just really, really wonderful and positive. He was an incredibly talented and very smart guy, uh, and, you know, could be really funny as well. I mean, just, you know, uh, but, you know, Never, we never had any any kind of negative experience with him. And when he was in the studio, we had the record crew there. We had you know Hal Blaine, uh, Barry Goldberg, um, Ray Pullman, uh, Steve Douglas. Uh, you know, and and those guys. You know, and 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 the way that he worked with Larry Levine, the engineer. I mean, it was he knew exactly what he was doing. And, uh, and they just they had they just had a great rapport with each other. I mean, you know, they, they it was just a really fun fun thing. And I, I think I'm pretty sure that that is really the last session 
that he ever did with the Wrecking Crew. If it's not the last session, it's got to be one of the last sessions he ever did with the Wrecking Crew. And uh, and that's on the CD, uh, Baby Let's Stick Together. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was just a wonderful experience. Now, was that before or after your album? That was after. That was... Uh, it was almost a year after after we recorded the album. We were we were at, uh, we were out in L.A. and actually we went out to L.A. to do that. It's just, what, what happened was he he, had, uh, he was about to do End of the Century with the Ramones, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was Seymour Seymour Stein who suggested to him that that he listen to our record and see if he wanted to do a song with us, and he did. And he called my brother up, I think it was about, you know, two in the morning or something, and my brother didn't, I mean, he thought it was a friend of his playing a joke on him when this guy got on the phone, you know, you know this is Phil, this is Phil Spector. And my brother's like, yeah, sure, you know, probably, you know, hung up on him and then Phil called back. <laughs> and this is really Phil Spector, and I want to record a song with you guys. And, you know, I think it was like a day, a day or two later, we were on a plane, we flew out to L.A., and we spent, like I said, uh, over two weeks at Phil's house rehearsing this song. And, you know, we, were, we went through a few songs, but mainly we worked on that song. And when he thought we were ready, he got brought us into the studio with all those guys. And we spent one whole day doing the basic track. And then we spent uh, about, a, I don't know, maybe four or five days doing the vocals. And, uh, and then, you know, that was it. And then I, I, I didn't actually hear that hear the real mix that he did until years later, there's an acetate of it um, that surfaced uh, through Warner Brothers. And I, I heard this, I was like, and this is one of the motivating things for me to, to try and get, you know, the Paley Brothers stuff released on CD and also, the, you know, the stuff that was never released to get that to come out. And I, I kept on bugging Andy about this, literally for years. I was like, Andy, you know, we really should you know, do a Paley Brothers, you know, compilation CD, and he is, he's very busy, you know, he's working on a lot of other stuff, and he, and he keeps very busy with his, with his work, and he was a little reluctant to do it, but once he got started, he became like a man obsessed, it was like, you know, we're going to listen to every single, <laughs> every single take, every single mix, and uh, we spent a long, long time going through that, but, uh, but that, you know, that Spectre track, I mean, I mean, that was, you know, I, I said, we got to get that out there so people can hear it. That is such a great story. Now, did Phil have 24 tracks at the time? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was Gold Star, it was 1978. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was 24 tracks. You know, the reason I'm asking is because he's famous for Back to Mono. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it's actually, yeah, it's mixed in mono. I'm pretty sure it is a mono. Oh, track. yeah. I, you know, you have visions of Phil Spector pulling out the four track or even the three track, you know? Yeah, but well, he did have, I mean, everybody was playing at once. I mean, it was, you know, everybody, you know, probably 20 people in that, in that studio, um, including me and my brother and all the, you know, all the, all the, the full time, you know, famous technical guys and the Kat, Barney Kessel's sons were both there playing. And I was playing, uh, I was playing one of the rhythm guitars, acoustic guitars, and you know, Phil. And I was doing a, some chord I was playing. He, he he picked this one chord out of this entire wall of sound. He's like, Jonathan, Jonathan, let me hear that chord. He's like, let me, what are you doing? Let me see that. He says, take that finger off there. <laughs> That's funny. To hear that out of all this stuff, this because I was playing like a, a, a you know an odd version of a G chord or something that he didn't like. So it was like, no, 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 do it, do it the right way. <laughs> but he actually, I mean, that's, that's the kind of ear this guy has. I mean, he, you could pick that out of that entire wall of sound. And for our viewers and listeners, you know, Jonathan Paley is talking about being in the studio, not only with Phil Spector, but with the Wrecking Crew. And we're in Winchester in the suburbs. We're on a bunch of cities right now on Verizon. Okay, Jonathan? But yeah. Um, for those watching and, and listening, you know, the Wrecking Crew were this famous band known to industry insiders, but the general public doesn't realize they played on, what, The Birds? and they played on everything, man. Everything, the Beach Boys back in the day. And so Jonathan got to play, you got to play guitar with the Wrecking Crew. Yes, and there's, a, there's actually a, a, a wonderful documentary that, uh, 
uh, you can see it only does like screenings because they, they, they're still trying to get the music, uh, you know, releases for the music, but they have screenings in various cities and various times. It's called The Wrecking Crew, and I think it has a Facebook site. You can look it up, and I've seen the movie twice. It's, it's just a fabulous movie because they interview all the surviving members. I think it was uh, directed by uh, Tommy Tedesco's son. Uh, Tommy, who you know, who was one of the great guitar players of, of the Wrecking Crew, um, and it's it's just a fabulous documentary. I encourage everybody to go see it. There's a famous uh, 45 B side from Phil Tedesco and Pittman. Yes, that's right. Yep. I don't. I can't tell you which record, but I remember that song. Phil would put songs on the flip that were what instrumentals, right? Some of them were instrumentals. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Crystals, I Love You, Eddie, was not an, an, an instrumental. They, that was the back of uh, He's a Rebel, I believe. But for the most part, he liked to focus on the A-side. And then there, there's some stuff he did under, like, assumed names of Phil Harvey, Bumbershoot. Um, uh, and then, he, you know, he's uncredited on a lot of his early stuff. Um, he produced some records, you know, back before he had his own label, where, you know, there wouldn't be a producer listed. Um, he, you know, he did a lot of records. I mean, he was just a very, very talented guy. And, and you know, I, I, like I said, it's just a shame, you know, what happened. Uh, who knows what really happened. I went to his trial a couple of times. Um, oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, you know, to say hello, show my support. And, um, you know, I have my own, my own opinion is that it was an accident. I really, I mean, I don't think he really, you know, intended to kill somebody. Um, who knows? Who knows? But, well, a, a good friend of mine is a friend of the victim, and yeah, he, well, he was. That, he, it's very sad what happened. I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing that happened. He was out there in, in uh, L.A. that night, and she called, and she's a friend of him and his his uh, wife. And his wife had just recently passed away, but at the time she was alive, and they were all close friends. And he's he's you know now he's kicking himself. My God, what if I? He just was too tired and didn't go out. And if he went out with her that night history would be different. Everything would be different, you know? And um, just, you know, it's just strange how life is. That, you know, um, she wouldn't have went there. She would have been with a friend, and all history would be different. But on to more pleasant subjects. Celine Dion worked with Phil. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's also there's rumors. There's, there's rumors. I've never actually... I mean, I didn't ask Phil about it, and, but I've heard people say that he actually recorded Elvis Presley as well, which I would love to hear. Now, was there a flip side for your song? No, that was that was it. It was just it was a single. It was going to be you know our second album, and uh, that was it. That's what we did. We recorded one song, and, and uh, you know who knows? Maybe we would have done more if it if it, uh, if it had ever come out back then. Now, where you fellows on Sire had, you know, um, Andy working with movie soundtracks, sounds like a Phil Spector, Paley Brothers would have been great for a movie soundtrack. You could have, made, you know, maybe the right film didn't come along for that. Well, like I, you know, like I said, I mean, if the record had come out back then, um, maybe we would have gone back into the studio with him. I, you know, I think, I think, you know, maybe there was. I mean, you know, we got along really well with him, especially Andy. I mean, Andy... Loved Phil, and I think Phil really loved Andy too. I mean, they stayed in touch afterwards a lot and saw each other quite a bit too. I mean, Andy used to go to his house a lot. Um, I went there a couple times. I went to his birthday party a couple times, um, you know. And but Andy, Andy was, you know, he, he stayed close with Phil. Um. I'm just thinking, you know, if you guys had uh, performed the Paley Brothers and Darlene Love, now that would have been a fun single. Oh, man, I, 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 I don't know if I can, I mean... I know. I would be embarrassed to sing on this thing. <laughs> I mean, well, it would be an honor, but I mean, she just, I mean, her, I mean, what, what a voice, what a performer. I mean, it just, there's, there's nobody like her. I mean... Yeah, it's a counterpoint on Rendezvous, you know, it'd be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that that would be that would be wonderful. Maybe who knows? Maybe it, it could still happen. You know, she's still out there. Well, you know, Doris Troy, who had the hit "Just One Look." Yeah. A lot of people don't know she's that voice on "Dark Side of the Moon." Which voice on "Dark Side of the Moon"? The wailing, you know, over the instrumentals. Oh. You know, um, 
the Pink Floyd, that masterpiece by Flink, Pink Floyd, it's, uh, it's Doris Troy of Just One Look fame. Oh, I didn't know that. I did not know that. If you got the vinyl LP, pull it out and you'll see her name. And she was a, she was a good friend of mine. And unfortunately, we lost her as well. Um, oh. But, you know, we do a little thing um, we, we, on the show called The Demo That Got The Deal. Okay? For Doris Troy, the demo that got the deal was Just One Look. Atlantic put out her demo. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And then we had the demo that got the deal with Steve Cataldo, How to Do It Twice. Because when Steve first did it in 1992 on 93.7, I used to uh, produce Harvey Warfield's show up there in Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah, you know, on, on WCGY. Uh -huh. So Steve phoned in, and, and the tape got erased. Or, no, it never took. When we taped it, nothing was on the tape, so Steve did it again on the TV show. So now I'm going to ask you, Jonathan, what was the demo that got the deal for the Paley Brothers? Well, you know, we sent we sent a lot of a lot of a lot of tapes to a lot of companies, and there was more than one song. You know, I mean, I'm trying to think now. I mean, we had versions of of uh, like four track versions of Rendezvous. We had a song called uh, uh, "My Feet on the Street," or the, you know, "The Beat of My Feet on the Street," or, or I, I think it was "The Beat of My Feet." That was a, that's you know that's one and then there was um, uh, we did a version did a, a cover version of Tennessee Waltz and I think that maybe that was the one that really caught Seymour's attention and surprised him because he he loved that song that the original Tennessee Waltz and he came to see us up in up um, we played outside of Boston um, I think it was in Gloucester. And he came to see us play, and pretty much said right then, you know, I want to, I want to sign you guys. And we didn't sign right then, but he said, I want to sign you guys. And we had some interest from from uh, some other people, but he he was really enthusiastic, and you know, uh, you know, he 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 just uh, he, he really he liked the demo, but he also liked he liked us live, and that was uh, you know that was how that all got started. And you know, in Gloucester is Willie Loco Alexander. He lives there. Yeah, I know, I know. And you know, on Solo Loco, he did Tennessee Waltz. No, I didn't know that. I, I was the A&R man for the French label, uh, New Rose Records. Oh, yeah, that's the real kids. Andy did the real kids for them, right? Andy did the real kids, but I was the first act that um, Patrick Maté had signed back in 78. He had a, a label called Flamingo. So he made me the A&R guy, and I signed Johnny Thunders. From, wow. from the New York Dolls, and then Willie Loco became available after MCA, so Patrick wanted him. And we recorded uh, at Electroacoustics in Boston, which is now the Outlook in Bethel, Maine. Uh -huh. But it was right next to this club called Jacques. So it, you played there? That was like a, uh, wasn't that like a, a lesbian bar? Or a gay it was a drag queen bar. Right, drag bar, it, yeah, right. It was it was a drag bar, and the queens would be out there fighting with knives at night. So Connie and Ted moved to Maine to get away from the, you know, the, the real craziness of the, uh, it was almost like a second combat zone sometimes. Yeah, you know, I, I, for a while, I, I drove a cab in Boston. Um, and I remember, you know, we used to get calls from, uh, I guess it was the, uh, one of the managers or something, and we'd have, to, we'd have to drive her back to Jamaica Plain, you know, after closing time. Uh, well, Rick Berlin booked the club for a while recently, or a few years back, but it's like the only club with a midnight license because, um, you know, uh, they want it shut at midnight. So it was a very interesting part of town. And there's Willie in the next room doing this really um, primal scream version of Tennessee Waltz. Wow. I got I to gotta get a copy to you. You got to hear it. I would love to hear that. Now, you know, you mentioned Johnny Thunders. You know, I knew Johnny. Um, actually, I rehearsed with the Heartbreakers like three times in this loft downtown Manhattan when they were, you know, you know trying to, you know, find a, a guitar player, a second guitarist. When Richard Hell was, it was Richard, Jerry, uh, Nolan, and, and Johnny. And I played with them, you know, I rehearsed with them like three times. And Johnny, Johnny and I got along just really, really great. He, you know, he, 
he, he loved the way I played. Uh, and Richard, you know, I've known Richard before then, and, and he and I were friends. But for some reason, Jerry Nolan just, just hated my guts. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but he just did not like me. So I didn't end up in the band, which, you know, who knows? Probably was a good thing. Probably saved my life. I don't know. It probably saved your life because Johnny's gone and Jerry Nolan di died rather, um, yeah. you know, that he, he's gone too. Um, but Johnny was the real thing. Um, yeah, and, and you know, and I, you know, people. Sometimes I hear people talk about this. Say, God, he was so nasty. He was such a jerk. He was so, you know, he was talented, but he was a real asshole. You know, I never saw that part of him. He was always, he was always, you know, nice to me, friendly, and uh, we got along really well. Well, he was nice to me, but I got him a record deal. Um, the word is that he had um, spit in the face of an A and R man in America, and no labels wanted to touch him after that, and. The uh, the daughters the boss you know the Boston band the daughters. No, I'm not familiar with them. They they're now the two saints and um, the darlings. Um, they were the two saints, the darlings, and uh, Joe Maz Joe Mazzari band. But um, they're part of the Willie Loco crowd. So the daughters were backing up Johnny, and that's how the tapes came to me. They knew I had the New Rose affiliation, and I signed the deal. And Johnny had a career on New Rose until his passing, you know? Uh, did, you, did you ever hear the story about Johnny being scouted by the Yankees? No. Supposedly, he was a really good, like, uh, a shortstop. Ah! A good defensive <laughs> shortstop. From what I understand, he was a good defensive shortstop and, and, you know, like, gotten scouted by the Yankees, but then, you know, got into rock and roll and drugs and that kind of uh, you know, steer them on a different path. That's pretty funny. I saw them March 1st, 1973, down at the um, k, -K, k Katie's. Yeah, you know, I never saw the Dolls play. Oh, they were great. Um, you know, of course, I saw the Heartbreakers. I mean, I saw their first gig at, at uh, this place in Queens. Oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was in Queens when it was a trio before they before Walter joined the band it was Richard, Jerry, and Johnny. I was still hoping to get the band at that point. Um, oh, Canterbury. I think it was called the Canterbury or something like that. Anyway, and, uh, you know, I, and then when I, I had my own band, uh, I formed a band called Mog. Uh, you know, we used to open up for all those bands, you know, in late 75 through 76 on CBGBs. And, and we opened up for the Emmett Max. We opened up for the Heartbreakers a couple of times. We opened up for television. But, uh, yeah, so I used to see, you know, I used to, I used to see him around all the time, hanging out, you know. What was the name of your band? Mong, M-O-N-G, one, one of the worst bands to ever do but we had a lot of fun. Oh, that's the main thing, you had fun. Um, when I first saw the Dolls in March of 73, it was like being in an airplane hangar with everything turned up to 15. Not 11 like Spinal Tap, but like to 15. It, you couldn't hear yourself think. At that point, were they, were they all like, uh, were they doing the red leather thing then? Yeah, they were in the leather and they were, uh, it was definite glam. And they couldn't really play. Um, a year later, they were on Revere Beach, and they were, maybe it was two years later, they were really great. They really actually learned how to play, and they were very, very good. Um, so I remembered how they had uh, evolved into a really good rock and roll band from being this very loud aggregation that mm, was, you know, kind of just like really pounding out noise. They got refined, and they, they really, well, look at them now. They're iconic, even without Johnny. Yep, yep, I know. I love Sil Sylvain. Have you heard his solo records? Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard his, his uh, latest solo stuff, but, but you know, he, uh, we actually, once in a while, communicate with each other via, you know, the, uh, I guess he's out here in L.A., right? I don't know. He was in New York, and he played Boston in 1998. 1999, I videotaped him at what was what spit before it became the House of Blues. Uh -huh. Because a friend of mine has a record label that had uh, Sylvain out, and he let me videotape him, and it's a great tape. of uh, Sylvain was just awesome, man, just very, very good. I didn't even know that, that, that spit became the house. I haven't, been, I haven't been to Boston since, like, 1990. And, but, I, you know, we used to play spit when, I was, uh, when we were... Cataldo and I were doing the reflectors, and then... The second version of the, or the, well, you know, one of the versions of the Nervous Theaters after the Reflectors, 
Uh, we played there a bunch of times. And, there were, there was, and what was the place also? There's another place on Lansdowne Street by Spit. I can't remember the Avalon, name. Avalon. Uh, connected to it? So, well, it was another club. It was a whole other club. There was Mamakin. The, the Aerosmith owned the uh, Mamakin. Maybe that was it. I, I, and then, if you, well, uh, if you walked out of Spit and you went to the right, there'd be Mamakin. If you went to the left, there was Bill's Bar. I wasn't Bill's Bar. I would have remembered that. And then there was Jillian's uh, Billiards. I mean, when I first came, one of the, one of the earliest things in Boston, when I, when I started going up to Boston, I went to the, uh, the Sword and the Stone, not the Sword and the Stone, the, um, the Cask and Flagon. And uh, it was Johnny Maestro and the Brooklyn Bridge playing live. Johnny Maestro played bass and sang lead. You know, and he's famous, of course, for uh, uh, the worst that could happen with the Brooklyn Bridge, which was, a, you know, just a, you know, a great record. But, you know, also the crest. Uh, right. Old. And uh, he was a really, he was a really good bass player. I mean, he, he played bass and sang and just a great voice. It was a fabulous show. It's the only show I've ever, I ever saw at the Castle Flag. I saw the Velvet Underground there without Lou, with Doug Ewell. Wow. And Bruce Springsteen. Wow. Well, well, you know that I was taping everything back in the day, so my tape of the Velvet Underground is on this box set from Captain Trip Records in Japan. And no one ever came to me for the original master, which I have digitized, and there's more songs on it. But they put it out, and it's um, it's called Final VU. So it's four discs of the band, the Velvet Underground, without Lou Reed in it. Well, and, I saw I saw Bruce Springsteen at Max's, and he was the opening act for a band called AIM, A I M, um, and Clarence Clemens actually played tuba. Uh, in the band, uh, and that was that was you know I, I was like who is this guy? It was like nineteen probably seventy three, seventy four, something like that. Um, yeah. And, and um, Venus De Milo was another club. Yes, I don't even remember that. Oh, Venus De Milo became Bill's Bar. So I'm trying to come up with the clubs on Lansdowne. But yeah, the House of Blues, the Lions Brothers get out of the um, Avalon business. And the House of Blues took it over and made it, renovated it. It's the House of Blues. Wow, the Lions Brothers. I haven't heard that in a long time. <laughs> I guess they're doing restaurants now. I found, I think they found that more comfortable, you know, than, you know, um, you evolve. I think I now, now was it, it was Charlie, right? Charlie Lyons? You no, know, John Lyons and Patrick Lyons. That's right. Yeah. One of them lived out in Fresh Pond and used to have these incredible parties out there. Uh, that I remember going to, and there was—I mean, this was like the you know the early '80s, and it, it was just you know just crazy, crazy stuff going on out there. So uh, you remember the band Spirit, Randy California? Yeah. I got a line on you. Yeah. We brought them to Boston in 1991. No, no, it was like '89, '89, um, and WZLX because Harvey Warfield was there, and so uh, Harvey was friends with them. We brought them over to Avalon. And John Lyons loves Spirit, so Lyons uh, called Harvey up, and his 10-year-old son answered the phone and was playing a video game. He goes, this is John Lyons for Harvey. So the kid goes, okay, I'll get Dad, and he puts the phone down and continues his video game with John Lyons holding. <laughs> when the kid finished the game, he went and got his dad, <laughs> and we booked the gig. Wow. <laughs> Poor John, he was waiting for a video game to end. It's a pretty funny story, but... Yeah. Um, Boston was Boston was I don't know if it still is, but I mean back then it was like it was, there was just, there were so many clubs you know all over town and and a band I mean you could actually you know eke out a living playing in a, playing in a, in a local rock band by you know by by doing the circuit of all these clubs but you know in Boston and and the surrounding areas I mean all the you know. There were just clubs everywhere. I don't know if it's still like that now or not. But it, it isn't. It isn't. The, the Middle East and Cambridge and TT the Bears and the All Asia and, and the Club Bohemia, there's a good five clubs in Central Square, Cambridge. But that wasn't our scene back then, remember? Is Jack still there? Nope, gone. Wow, I played Jack. But what about the In Square Men's Bar? Nope, uh, he's a friend of mine. He's um, The owner is, is on my Facebook, but the In Square Men's Bar is long gone. Oh boy, that was a strange room to play because it was like so long and narrow, and you had to play across this like very narrow space. 
It was like a mini paradise, if you think about it. Oh, man, it's much smaller than the paradise. <laughs> right, but what I'm saying is you're looking against the wall. You're staring at a wall in front of you, you know? Like it's a bartender, like three feet in front of you. You can reach over and get a beer. <laughs> you know? It was fun. We did a WCOZ night there. Yeah, oh, God, COZ. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. So... I'm excited. You know, I, I'm hoping that maybe you do a download of the live at Madison Square Garden. Just put the whole thing up on download, you know? Well, you know, I, I really, I mean, it, 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 you know, to be honest with you, a lot of it is pretty buff performance-wise. I mean, you know, especially vocally. And it's mostly, you know, because, you know, I, you know, I was like, whoa, I, I was like in shock. I was always like, oh, my God. And we went through this, we went through this stuff, and the... Yeah. And you know, uh, Sheila are two of the two of the tracks where the vocals actually you know matched up really well, and I wasn't totally screwing up like I was on a lot of the other stuff. But you know, th but there are but there are some aspects to some of the other tracks, especially Eric uh, Eric Rose on guitar. I mean, he just he's such a great guitar player, and he did some just incredible stuff when we were playing live. Maybe a little too much sometimes. Now, was it the Nervous Eaters and Eric Rose? No, oh, it was the Paley Brothers. I mean, you know, Eric, Eric and my brother were in the Sidewinders. Right, I, I, rem I saw them. Eric's family and my family, my, my parents and Eric's parents went to college together in the 40s. And I've known, I've known Eric since I was, you know, a, a, a child. Uh, we used to, you know, we used to visit each other. His family lived in Washington, D.C. We were living in upstate New York. When I was a kid, and you know, we you know we would go down to visit them in D.C. They would come up and visit us. And Eric, you know, was just always this great guitar player. And then Andy, Andy and Eric, you know, started actually Catfish Black before they were the Sidewinders. They were called Catfish Black, and it was Andy on drums. But Andy, you know, started off as a drummer. He's a, he's a, just a fabulous, great, great drummer. Uh, Still is. I saw your brother play drums at the Un uh, Stone Phoenix Coffee House with the Modern Lovers. Yeah, well, there you go. You know, I, it's funny, I know Andy and I both did a series of shows with Jonathan uh, as the Modern Lovers at the Kitchen in New York, and I think it was 1974. Um, and it was a Andy on drums, and then sometimes I play drums. We'd switch on and off. We'd switch guitar to drums. Back in Jonathan up, and that was uh, and it was great because the uh, you know and in the audience at the time, although we didn't know it, were uh, uh, David Byrne, Chris France, Tina Weymouth, uh, you know who we were you know, wanted to do the Talking Heads, uh, watching watching uh, those shows, and there are act there actually is a uh, a recording of uh, one of those shows that you can that you can find on the internet, um, and also Jonathan would uh, step aside. And let Andy sing a couple of songs, and we did um, "Good Night Baby" by the I think it was originally by the Cookies or somebody like that. But the Butterflies, the Butterflies, um, uh, which was on Redbird Records, we did a version of that, and sometimes we did Rendezvous. I mean, these these days were precious, and and oh yeah, the kids today don't understand what was happening and how special it really was. You know, and at the time, you know, we, I didn't realize it. You know, I mean, I was, I was, I was thrilled to be playing. You were living it. How could you realize that you were living it? You know. Well, but then later on, you know, people would, you know, bring these things up and say, "I'd say, oh, you know, I play with the Marlins," and they'd say, "Get out of here! We never play with the Marlins." <laughs> I don't want to argue with you about it. You know. We've got our film critic in about two minutes, but I want to ask Eric Rose on guitar and the Paley Brothers. Who else was in the Paley Brothers band? Okay, well, once again, it was the Nervous Eaters. It was Steve Cataldo, Rod Skeen. Oh, 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 you mean with Sean, with, on the Sean Cassidy tour, too? Yeah, on the Sean Cassidy tour, we took them on the road. And, uh, yeah, it was the same, the, same, it's the same lineup that was on stage at the Paradise. Oh, only Eric Rose joined, too. No, he, he was with us all along. He, he was, oh, wow. He was on the original album. He's on the Paley Brothers album. He's on our, our EP. He's on our first single. He was on all that Paley Brothers stuff. So it was really the Nervous Sidewinders. Well, they, now the Nervous Eaters were not on the record. I know, I know. I'm, I'm just saying, no, live, it was the Nervous Sidewinders. I'm being funny. It was the Nervous Sidewinders featuring Mong. <laughs> there you go. 
Jonathan, we've got to have you in studio if you ever come back to Boston. You know, because it's a lot of fun in studio, but we, we're thrilled that you called. It's it's just, it's been awesome talking to you. I want everybody to rush out. And no, 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 we can't say that. So I stop. I got to stop you. We're a nonprofit here. Oh, okay. All so right. rush out and go to the Paley Brothers website. Is there a website? Yes, there's a Facebook page, the Paley Brothers. Thank okay. You. Yeah, go to the Facebook. It's free. Go to Facebook and look for Paley Brothers. Yes. And uh, yeah. We can, we can talk about anything free, and the Facebook is free. Great. Cool, Jonathan. For the music, sir. Hey, keep on rocking, man, and uh, you know, we'll keep in touch because I'd love to have you in studio sometime. All right. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be asked. All right, man. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Jonathan Paley, that was fun. And now it's time for Frank. Good old Frank. Um, we're going to change... The show, if I can dial the right number. We're going to change guests. Frank Pellestrino talking about movies. Welcome back, Frank. Hi, it's good to be back, Joe. How you been? Good. I just talked to Jonathan Paley by phone. He phoned in. Um, he was in the Paley Brothers. They opened for Sean Cassidy, David Cassidy's. Younger brother, mm -hmm. they did a tour with them back in the 70s, so uh, I, I've known the Paley brothers for decades, so it was great having him call in. Yo, you've known everybody for decades. I, you know, it's just, we, we, we were reminiscing about the old scene, it was a lot of fun. Um, but, where, how did you do, uh, did you go overseas? Let's see, my wife and I went to Spain and Morocco. Spain and Morocco, did you enjoy it? We did. My only advice is don't drive in Madrid. It's worse than New York, and it must be worse than Boston. That bad, huh? And are the hey, Boston's one of the more unpleasant places I've ever driven in my life. <laughs> Me too. Madrid gives it a, a run for its money. Me too. I've driven in Boston and New York, and they're both tough. Yeah, well, the thing I don't mind about New York is that it's so crowded, the traffic never goes very fast, so you can't kill anybody. But in Boston... Uh, it's a madhouse. <laughs> well, you know, I'm on this long and winding road that comes to this TV station, okay? Yeah. And some SUV on this long and winding road where you just got to go slow. And I don't go that, you know, I'm in the speed limit. And the guy's up, or gal, is up against my bumper with these big headlights. And, and you know, I'm going to do a show. What's the point? Yeah. Just well, back off. You know. I first, the first time I drove in Boston was like, uh, oh, over 20 years ago. And I got back and I said, you know, up there... The bigger the, the bigger the car has the right of way. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't matter, that, doesn't matter what the boy is. Or what the, <laughs> and, you know, I like going the speed limit. I just like, you know, uh, yeah, I like to be mellow and be ready for my show and be in a good frame of mind. And they're all, you know, no, they're, they're not all. There's some good drivers out there. There's some maniacs. And, it, it, you know, it's just, ah! It's like the rebel stuff set. Rebel set. So that's the nice rebel rough. The rough rebels. The, the Rebel Set is the, is the movie you're showing tomorrow. And sorry for driving you crazy with the wrong title. My uh, yeah, it, is, it is hard to find out the movie when you got the title wrong, but we, we made it. Okay, tomorrow night, you've got, you got to talk about two movies tonight, right? Oh, I forgot, yeah. And we have, um, we've got seven and a half minutes to do so. Okay, so The Rebel Set, 1959, it's a heist movie. And it starts off in the beatnik world, and it quickly gets out of that, but it's got this jazz, jazzy score. And, Joe, that, that movies like this are one of the reasons I love doing this show, because I never would have heard of this movie and certainly never would have watched it, except I had to watch it for you. Thank you, Anthony. It, and it is a delight. Thank you, Anthony Gamari. Yes. <laughs> and thank you, Anthony. It's, it's a wonderful film. I mean, it's cheaply made, you know, so you, you have to, you know, kind of go with that flow. But the, it's well written. It's certainly well acted. They picked up a lot of... You'll, if you watch the movie, you'll see a lot of familiar faces that you'll have trouble putting a name to. But you say, I've seen that guy before, because the, 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 even, even some of the very small parts are played by familiar faces. I could name some names, but they wouldn't mean anything to most people. But you'll say, gee, I've seen that face before. The face you're most likely to recognize is the criminal mastermind behind the, uh, the, uh, the plot, which is played by the Edward Platt, who is a name that may not mean many things to many people, but he played Chief in the old Get Smart series. Oh, whoa. And he's quite out of character here as, as a criminal mastermind. He's quite good. 
And I, I, you know, I can't praise this movie enough, and I, I really admire it when, when people go ahead with no budget and don't let that stop them. And the reason it's so good is uh, its director, is a man named Gene Fowler, won't mean much to most people, but he was an A-list, A-list editor in Hollywood for many years. He directed a handful of films, but he was mainly an editor. And his photographer was, is a, again, won't mean anything to anybody, his name Carl Struss, but he was an Academy Award-winning cinematographer who, who you know, was in, in the 1950s, he was on his, the downside of his career. But the two of these guys together, uh, you know, they must have been the, the source behind it, the inventiveness of the filming and, and the, the, you know, a lot of these lower-budget movies, you kind of have to strain yourself with the plot, and that really doesn't happen. I can't say enough good about this movie. Your, your viewers are in for a real surprise if they give it, if they give it a chance, because it is low-budget, it's easy to dismiss it. I was looking up the comments on it online, and they, they quite frankly don't do the movie justice. It's much, much better than I was anticipating, and I said, hooray, Anthony. Very That's, cool. That's the movie. Yeah, you've, you've uh, Anthony has has found an, an overlooked gem as far as I'm concerned. I could watch this movie 20 times more and, and, and still like it. Excellent, and that's going to be played tomorrow night at nine o'clock on December sixth. Yes. Now and next the thirteenth, which we won't be here. We won't be on the twelfth. Okay. Because there's a party here. No, no, there's a board meeting here. Okay. Which hopefully will become a party. And uh, the party's the night before. But you're, in, you're invited. You and your wife are invited to fly to Boston, come to our Christmas party. Not in the winter. We, you invite me in the summer, we might make it. Okay. <laughs> One thing happens in Houston, you lose all resistance to cold. It's going to be in the 30s tomorrow, and you people would laugh at the temperature we're going to have here because it's, it's, it's quite pleasant for you, but we're going to die in it because you lose all resistance to cold down here. Hmm. Okay, the, move, the movie for next week is Two-Fisted Law. Uh, it's a Western in 1932. It's, it's remembered today mainly because it's one of John Wayne's first movies. He's 25 years old. He, he's on camera a lot, but he doesn't have a lot to do with it. He's mainly in the background. And it's also an early movie of Walter Brennan, who is a, an actor that the younger generation may not know, but he, he was the first man to win three Academy Awards. And of course, he was the star of The Real McCoys through the 1950s. And he, is, he has a bigger part uh, Towards the end of the movie, you hardly see him in the beginning, but towards the end of it, he becomes central to the plot. But it is a Tim McCoy movie, and Tim McCoy is, I think, is forgotten by anyone but a Western aficionados now. But he was one of the major Western stars of the 1920s and 30s. And think about a lot of the Western stars of the 1920s and 30s, they were great cowboys. These guys could ride. These guys could shoot. They had actually been lawmen in the Old West. Oh, a lot of them came to Hollywood, including Tim McCoy as technical advisors on westerns, and got into it. They were great cowboys. They weren't such great actors, to be sure. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, uh, the dialogue is kind of flat in this. But uh, it, it's, I, I enjoyed it because there is, you know, it, it, it's a, an example of the westerns that used to saturate early television when I was a kid. This, this movie is barely an hour long, and movies like this, would have been trimmed to fit a half hour or an hour of time slot when I was a kid. And these are the, you know, before I became an avid Costello fan, before I discovered the adventures of Superman, I was watching old westerns on TV because that's what there was. They were playing old westerns like this. So this is a, this is a very Depression-era western. It starts with the foreclosure of, um, of, a, of a Tim McCoy, the hero. It starts with a foreclosure on his farm, and there's another, the farm of his girlfriend is about to be foreclosed on, and it's all done by this dastardly villain. And you can very tell, see the, see the uh, era it was made in, because that's the center of the plot. Is, uh, there's, there's, not a, there's some gunfire near the end, there's some heroics near the end, but basically, basically the people complaining that they're, they're, they've mortgaged away their, their lives, and now they've got to pay the piper. One thing to watch in this movie, this is an era when... People were much shorter than they are today, noticeably shorter than they are today. Tim McCoy's the hero. His official height is five foot eleven. To that, I say, ha ha! I don't think so. But John Wayne is a real live six foot four. And in the, especially in the beginning of the movie, when John Wayne comes in the scene, they tend to have. There's one scene with him and two other cowboys. Ten seconds. Okay, they're standing on a platform, and he's then standing in the street, so they won't accentuate his height because he's out. He's at least eight inches taller than these guys. And the movie again is it's, called? Yes. Two-fisted. The story is tomorrow's Rebel set. 
Talk to you soon, Joe. Two-fisted law, right? Right. Two-fisted law is next week. Thank you. Thank Good night. You. And that's our show for tonight, Visual Radio, with Frank Delastrito, Jonathan Paley, Views and the Opinions in Mind, Reeling is next. You can watch Reeling right here on Windcam, and then you can watch Rebel Set tomorrow night on Windcam.